And my name is Scott Shepard. I'm a reformed racist because of exactly what I was, and I'm happy to share my story. I was born and raised in Indianola, Mississippi. It's actually the home of B.B. King. And mm. spent, spent most of my years in Mississippi and Tennessee, actually Memphis. You do sound like you do have more of a Tennessee accent. I will say that. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't hold it against me, please. <laughs> no, I won't. I But I will say that most people don't know the difference. And I'm like, no, there's actually a difference of, of the accents between states. Actually, um, actually, Mississippi's got two accents, a Mississippi accent and a Mississippi Delta accent. Yes, that would make sense. Yep. <laughs> Are you from the, is the city you're from in the northern part of Mississippi? Actually, it's in the central part, central part okay. of the state. Do you come I've only the- been to, oh, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I've been to Tupelo, where I will say it again because I think I've said it before. The nicest Starbucks I have seen in this nation is located in Tupelo, Mississippi. Tupelo is not really far from me. Of course, where I'm at now, I'm in South Haven, Mississippi. And Tupelo is not, but maybe an hour and a half from me. So I know exactly where you're going to spend a lot of time in Tupelo. Uh, Shireen, is is Tupelo where, am I mixing up my information? Is that where Elvis is from? Elvis's birth home was there. Okay, okay. see, I knew that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> good job good job and the only reason why i would end up in tupelo let's be real because <laughs> it, it's a pretty small town otherwise i'm fortunate i get to pass graceland probably maybe once two three times a week so i um, uh, is it safe right to assume it. that you've been to graceland oh sure yes been there probably about four times and actually where I, where i'm at in south haven mississippi i'm just right across the state line from memphis and i can be in graceland at in less than 10 minutes. How much money have you blown in that gift store? <laughs> well, well, since I don't have a whole lot, not a whole lot. <laughs> but uh, I, I've always thoroughly enjoyed it and really and, and always like to go back. Now, Scott, you're, you're from, you know, the Memphis, Mississippi area. Did you come from a large family? Well, actually, I, well, I came from a family that, of course, uh, my mother had been married. Uh, of course, my dad was her second husband, and I had an older brother and older sister, which was my half-brother and half-sister. And then she married my dad, and there was three more kids, you know, that came, well, blessed her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she might not feel that way. Of course, she's passed away now, but I, I'm not sure if she'd feel blessed enough. She had, we had, there was five of us. She had. Were you guys close when you were younger? Uh, we were to a certain. Well, I, well, let me let me take it back. No, we really wasn't because I grew up in a uh, a home environment that really was uh, di- you know, was dysfunctional. Uh, oh, my father's, my father actually was an alcoholic and okay. there was always, always turmoil and fussing, fighting, violence and things like that. So really, really, we were not close when we were younger. I, I want, I would like to ask because considering, you know, the, the main topic of, um, why we asked you to speak with us, how much do you think that home environment you know, um, kind of unstable, like the instability that comes with an alcoholic or any addict parent, right? Um, And then also just not being able to get along with family and therefore not really feeling like the community that usually naturally comes with your immediate family, right? Feeling that sense of belonging. How much do you think that has to do with where you ended up, the path you ended up taking later in life? Well, I think if you had asked me that same question probably years ago or, or when I was a lot younger, I'd probably tell you not a thing. That uh, being come from you know coming from a divorced family and mm-hmm. uh, dysfunctional and things like that, that it didn't bother me at all. I'm fine, but I wasn't fine. You know, you could just look at my past and the things I was doing, and it took me later, you know, till later on in years to find out exactly what the real problem was. So, yes, today, I'll tell you, it played a big part in it. And 
what would you, I mean, because when did you finally make that determination? When were you finally able to realize that? What changed? Make the change uh, to realize that. For you to realize that it was your family. No, to realize what caused that wrong path. Oh, well, actually, I really, I really did not uh, realize it till probably, I was probably right at around uh, 30 years old or so. And, of course, I'm 57 now. I just had a birthday the other day. And hey, congratulations. Found, Happy birthday. Hey, I'm, ha- I'm grateful to have another <laughs> year behind me, and I'm looking forward to a bunch of more. Bunch more. But, uh, you know, I, I guess it was... I guess it was like around somewhere around 1990 is when I really came to terms with the person that I really was and was able to make a change. So can you talk about that time in your life? Well, then? Sure. Give us sure. a little more insight. Well, sure. You know, of course, I came up, you know, through the years, you know, my younger years, a teenager and on up into my 20s and stuff and I was very active in the white supremacist movement Ku Klux Klan if there was a if there was a white supremacist movement out there or a racist movement I was per- pretty much connected to it because I had gotten that deep but there came a time because I was, I was like I said being from Indianola Mississippi and home of B.B. King I was also raised by a black lady whose name is Becky and uh, she actually she my mother was adopted uh, when they brought my mother in on a pillow, when she was adopted, Becky was there. And Becky was there when my mother died, and Becky's still there at 102 today. Wow. And, wow. Uh, and she, and I'm glad to say I, I went to her 100th birthday, and I'm going to her the next one, you know, her 102nd uh, here in October. But I was, re- you know, I was really raised by her, and her family was my family. And I think there was always something deep inside of me. Always, want, you know, always made me wonder: Am I doing the right thing? Do I really believe this stuff? There was something always kind of that little voice in the back of your head asking me that question, but I ignored it and went on with my racist life. And then, of course, around 1990, what brought it to an end? And of course, I'd come up on the radar, the FBI. There had been some mail bombs that were going off in Alabama and Georgia that killed some judges and uh, lawyers, civil rights lawyers. And come to find out that the gentleman that did it wasn't a white supremacist. He was just, you know, just a kook. But he had, you know, was trying to send the blame off towards white supremacist people. And uh, I come up on the radar and had been questioned about that. And I came up under a lot, you know, of course, I was under a lot of stress wasn't happy with myself and I left a restaurant in Nashville one night where I had I went and had dinner and I was drinking and I left that restaurant and then of course when I left I got down the road and the police pulled me over and I, I I described it as like I always do I opened up the car door and there was just not one car two cars or three police cars there was an ocean of a sea of blue lights behind me and surrounded me so they took me in and I was charged with uh, well, I failed a sobriety test, and I also had a weapon underneath the front seat of my car. That threw me into oh, the courts. Yeah. That threw me into the court system. When that threw me into the court system, I came up with a plan myself, and then of course I had talked to a lawyer, who actually was a black lawyer, and I thought, you know, he's a public defender. When I got him, I said, "Well, I'm I'm fried. Are you are you going to find out about my past? He's not going to defend me, but he did." And uh, we're still friends today. But that, th- like I said, threw me into the court system. I came over with a plan. I said, well, I'm going to pull one of the oldest tricks in the book. I'm going to go to an alcohol and drug treatment center, get my paperwork, and take it back to the judge and hand it to him and get these charges dropped. And after he dropped his charges, going with my racist life. Well, I was fooled. I didn't realize what, you know, when I went in that treatment center in Nashville, Tennessee, that I was going in one person and coming out another. Okay. Okay. So real, uh, it was the ha-ha joke's on you. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yes, it was. Right? I, wasn't, I mean, I wasn't so smart after all, you know. I mean, I mean, of course, I, you know, I don't know what religion, uh, you know, of course, y'all are and stuff. And of course, I, you know, I, mm-hmm. I do believe in God and and 
I'm, I'm not a real, real religious person, but I, I do know who God is, and I believe in God. And I think God paid, played a uh, trick on Scott, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that was his, and that was his way of of getting, you know, bringing me down to earth and and, and getting my mind and heart in the right spot. S- Scott, how did you? I mean, I know it was surrounding you, but when you were younger, how did you? What was your introduction into white supremacy? Well, of course, I was born again, born in Mississippi Delta, and back I was born in 1959, and of course, grew up through the turbulent, you know, years of the uh, race issues and problems that was going on through the state. Mississippi was a hotbed of racial uh, turmoil. I was in that state, and of course, I wasn't raised by racist parents. My dad, and mother, and dad didn't teach us racist things, but we were still surrounded by, you know, the community. Well, I, I don't want to say the community because the whole community was not racist, but th- there was elements and people in that community that were, and and definitely in the state. And uh, I guess my first introduction, of course, with the Ku Klux Klan was in history books in Mississippi uh, public schools, the Mississippi history books, and w- there was a segment on the Ku Klux Klan. And I remember reading about that. And, of course, those books at the time, did not portray the Ku Klux Klan as a bad organization or a good organization. That was my question. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It, you know, it didn't portray it as, as good and it did not portray it as bad. It was just an organization that, well, basically it said, you know, that it, you know, it, it was fighting for, you know, uh, equal rights for white people and, and, things of that nature. Of course, Indianola, my hometown, is also the birthplace of the White Citizens Council. So, like I said, you can probably pretty much see where the element of the white supremacist people were in my life surrounded me. What did your folks think of you joining the KKK? Well, of course, by that time, my parents, of course, my dad was, a, he worked on a riverboat and was gone all the time. He was captain on a riverboat. And my mother was a school teacher and actually was out in Texas at the time and then moved back to Louisville, Kentucky. And like I said, they did not teach us racist, uh, you know, views at all. So I had a lot of problems with my family because they did not agree with what I was doing. And you said you essentially had a second mother. You, you said, was her name Becky? Becky. Actually, her name is Becky Hawkins. And if you if you research uh, right now, there was a book just written not long ago by a sweet lady from Oxford who wrote a book uh, on the on called Jewel. I, I believe it's Jewels of the Delta or Mississippi Delta Jewels. I can't think of her name, but she's a professor at, at, at Ole Miss. And a segment of that book is a picture of Becky in there and an article, I mean, a segment of the book about her and, and my parent, grandparents are referenced in that book. And I think the lady that wrote the book told me that Becky was probably the only only person that she interviewed that really had a lot of positive things to say about the people that she worked for, which was my grandparents when she was younger and growing up in Mississippi. So, like I said, my family did not teach racism. And they were just flabbergasted, and and it, it really destroyed a lot of you know relationships within my family. Of course, did you end up treating Becky differently, or did you kind of do a separation in your mind when you were? I did a separate. Right, I did a separation. I, I mean, I love Becky to death, and and her grandson lives out in California that I'm real close to, and her son that I grew up, you know, hanging out at his store in Indianola, and as a kid. I mean, I just ignored them. I mean, I, I, I separated myself from, myself from them and did not visit with them or anything like that for years and years and years until I finally came to terms with what the real problem was and able to get my life straight. I went to Becky's house where she still lives in Indianola and knocked on her door. And, and she knew about my past. Her whole, fa- whole family did. And she walked out on the porch and she saw me. And when she saw me, the door slung open and I was welcomed in open arms. Nothing else has ever been said about it. I was home. That's amazing. It's, you know, and, it kind of makes me want to cry. <laughs> well, I'm, I'll be honest. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. You know, of course, they say men aren't supposed to cry. Well, I'm a man and I've cried a lot. 
and uh, yeah. I've cried a lot. And you, you can't. I mean, if you if you just don't understand the, the weight that got lift, lifted off my shoulders and how I am today compared to what I was then. I was a very I was in a dark place. During that dark time, how how deep and how strong was your hate that you had? And was it just geared towards or aimed rather towards African Americans? I think I think mainly, of course, it, it got pretty deep. I mean, I joined when I was like seventeen years old, and by the time I was nineteen, in between nineteen and twenty, I had risen to the high, you know to the highest rank that you can in the state of Tennessee, and that's what they call, you know, a silly name, Grand Dragon, which is compatible to, you know, you compare it to like the governor of the state of Tennessee. I mean, I mean, I, no disrespect to the governor of mm-hmm. Tennessee. I mean, that you know, as far as the power and the structure that, you know, that's the rank that, that I held. And it, um, I, I, it, it's really hard to under, you know, understand and explain, but it wasn't. No, they got into the Jewish issue also, the uh, you know Ku Klux Klan and th- and other white supremacist groups are very anti-Jewish. I never got into that. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, I really didn't understand it. I mean, it was around me, and sh- and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to soften and, and make things look you know less evil on myself because I was right there with these people. I cheered them on. I said the things also. I'm just as guilty as they are. But, uh, you know, I really, did I believe in the anti-Jewish stuff? I don't think so. I was raised with Jew, Jews and Jewish people in Indianola and in the state of Mississippi. That really never crossed my mind. You know, honestly, I, I wanted to ask you, what exactly does Ku Klux Klan stand for what does that mean well it's an old term that came of course you know of course some of the symbols came from scotland and of course Ku Klux. it the the information about that it it describes a circle you know Ku Klux, and it's hard again it's hard to explain on the phone a circle and it's you know it pertains to the circle you know of course white people you know that they got their own uh, identity, and that's exactly you know what it kind of stands for. Gotcha. So my only reference of the KKK is what I see, you know, of course what I read in books, but a lot of what I've seen in TV shows and what I've seen in movies. You know, all, all I keep thinking of is burning crosses and people burning down houses, and just that's what I see from actually being somebody who is actually a part of that. Can you kind of walk us through? what the actual experience was like, what it's like to be a member and the kind of things you actually were a part of? Sure. I mean, basically, of course, when I entered, like I said, I was around 17 years old. Um, and of course, Rose, you know, you know, of course, went to Grand Dragon of the state of Tennessee. And at the same time, I was entering college and I went to college and after I got a full, I'm a funeral director and bomber. After I left college, I got out, and of course, I was still involved with all this, you know, all the garbage. And the Klan has a has a problem trying to portray themselves in another image than what they really are. They want to want the public to think they're an upstanding uh, organization working for the betterment of the community and the state and things like that when not when when that's not true and of course i was one that of course i had to go to school and and went to do my job every day and had to wear a suit and tie so i and uh, you know other people also were, were used as recruitment tools you know for the public to you know for the public image of the clan because you know we were considered you know professionals rich i mean my job wasn't any better than anybody else's. You know, I'd rather give my job to somebody and go elsewhere after I got into the funeral business. It was was a terrible job, but, I mean, bad. But that's what they did. They used, you know, us as a recruitment tool. So far as, you know, and, of course, the political issues and running for office, we were also involved with that. But when it came to the the violence and, and burning of crosses, sure, 
there were times I was involved with that. But when it came to like violences, violence and beating of people, I was aware of it and found out about it, but I was not part of it because they have their own inner circle and they have the people that are, this inner circle is not known by the general membership of the clan. They, they're used specifically for acts of violence. So if the law enforcement or someone got, you know, questioned them or arrested them or something like that, they couldn't, you know, they don't know who they are. They couldn't, you know, people couldn't spill the beans or anything like that. So that's basically how, you know, how that inner circle worked. Wow, and would that inner circle they wouldn't go to the same meetings or attend any of the same functions? Oh sure, oh no, no, no. They would they would go to the same meetings and things like that. But there also were separate meetings for the inner circle, gotcha. and the inner circle, you know, like I said, their their membership was not known to the general membership as to who they you know who they were or what they were a part of and what they were involved in. So would you say that the portrayal that often is in media of the KKK, would you say it's pretty spot on? Oh, yes, I, I would. Yeah. You know, of course, if you remember the movie Mississippi Burning of the three civil rights workers down in uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi, that, you know, that movie was portrayed and, and based on those civil rights workers. It was dead on. It was dead on. Perfect. And so I mean, I, there's no way to cover up the violence and in the past of the Ku Klux Klan because it's true. And the media has been pretty much accurate in, in what I've seen. And why do you think uh, it was something that, it, you know, like you were saying, you know, they wish that they could kind of soften their image, but you can't. It's out there. Why do you think, though, that they still succeed at getting people to sign up and become members as, you know, it's not a secret that what they really do? Well, I think they've got people out there that, of course, again, when I joined at 16, 17 years old, that's one of the, one of the you know, recruitment tactics that they use. You know, they, they well, it's just like street gangs, you know, it doesn't matter if it's black, white, Hispanic or, or any other kind of street gang that's on, on in these cities. They do the same thing, and the Klan does it also. You know, they hammer in on these kids that have problems at home. They, they're looking for a place to fit in. They're looking for a family and, and a sense of importance, and they use that tactic, and, and they take it, you know, use that weakness and, and draw these young kids in, and that's exactly what the Klan does. Gotcha. Is it typical for a grand... You said dragon, because Grand Wizard's something different, right? Well, Grand Wizard is in is, is used for actually it's two terms: Imperial Wizard and Grand Wizard. You know, they're the same, you know basically the same thing. You know, that's one thing people you know they say the Ku Klux Klan. There is no the Ku Klux Klan. There are so many different factions out there, different organizations that got different members. Uh, different leaders and things like that, but some may refer to their head as grand a grand wizard and some imperial wizard. So, and of course, that's a that's a that's a rank that I did rise to. You know, at, at the very end of my you know involvement with the white supremacist movement because I was I was you know through with it. Mm -hmm. Um. So the question I the question that I have regarding that are. Do you find that a lot of the members of the clan, do they fizzle out after a certain age? Do you see people making changes of hearts as they get older? Is it predominantly a young group? Well, I, I have seen I, Right, I understand. I have seen that. And, of course, you know, of course, the, the white supremacist movement changed over the years, and they started coming in with these uh neo-nazi skinheads and young kids with you know with street gangs exactly what they were they came into the movement i noticed that as, as these young kids would get older they would they would change from the mm -hmm. uh skinheads movement and they would get involved with the kkk or other white supremacist groups i saw that and then of course 
the members that were in the clan, as they got older, yes, I saw a lot of them change of heart, you know, have a change of mm-hmm. heart, but not very many. Well, because, you know, you, you know how you mentioned gangs, right? Right. And I guess, well, maybe you just don't see a lot of old gang bangers because a lot of them don't get to make it to that age is kind of the whole idea that we're supposed to have. So never mind. <laughs> never mind. Because I was thinking, well, maybe just people get older and they start knowing better. No, nah, no, nah, they didn't get to last that long, unfortunately. Well, you know, and there's that other flip side that as you get older, you kind of get stuck in your mentality. I don't, you know, if you don't get out by a certain yeah. time. That's true. Well, a lot, too. you know, a lot of these kids, a lot, a lot of the young kids and the younger people that get involved, like with the skinhead movement, they either end up dead, in jail, or they, you know, have a. And they are some of those that have had a change of heart. Thank goodness for that. And then the others that have moved over into the Klan movement or the white supremacist movement. You know, I um, work with. I, I, you know, I've teamed up with. A, who is a gentleman, actually, he's actually my brother, I would call him my brother, you know, Daryl Davis, who's from Maryland, who's a professional Mm -hmm. black musician, and Daryl, Daryl's one of these that, you know, of course, when I first heard about Daryl, I said, man, he's crazy. What he does is goes, you know, he goes around the country, he makes friends with Klansmen, and he's a black, he makes friends with them, and, and, has has been very successful in drawing a lot of these people out of the Klan and white supremacist movement. And Daryl and I just finished a documentary together. Actually, the documentary was about Daryl, and I was invited to, you know, play a part in it, Accidental Courtesy. And it, it's based on Daryl's life and what he's been doing as a, as a professional musician and then his involvement with Klan members. And we've been able to, uh, of course, become close and work together on trying to, you know, break down some of the barriers of racism. I want to clarify that. So you said it. What is accidental courtesy? That's the t- name of accidental cur- accidental courtesy. Daryl Davis, mm-hmm. race and America. It's a it's a documentary based on Daryl doc- Davis's life, who, like I said, is a professional musician and mm-hmm. travels the country giving speeches in different colleges and and meeting and, and making friends with you know active active clan members and has been very successful in drawing them out of the movement and, and of course right. I'm very I'm very grateful and I appreciate him inviting me to be a part of that because it it, it tells a story that of course the movie's not out yet it's still in the film fest circuit right now already won three awards that i know of so it's, it's going to be a good movie and, and i think he'll do well you know when he hits the theaters okay and i also wanted to clarify the other book that you were speaking about i think it's called delta jewels in search of my grandmother's wisdom by alicia burton Steele. oh that's it Does that sound that's right Le- miss burton that's it that's exactly okay. that's the book yes and there's a segment. There's a and there's a segment in there, like I said, uh, that has Becky. Re- well, her name's Rebecca. Rebecca Hawkins. Rebecca Scott Hawkins. And there's a segment in there where she, you know, discusses, you know, her life. And then, of course, my, you know, my grandparents. And there's a lot of things that I learned from her that I didn't even know. You know, my grandparents. I, I figured my grandparents was total racist, like everybody else. You know, the, the older generation. But I learned a lot about my own family. That, and kind of getting back to family, that is a question. Apparently, I accidentally muted myself. So I was trying to ask questions and wondering why you guys were speaking <laughs> over me. <laughs> 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 kind of going back. Mm. Um, one of the questions I have, because what I find, have you ever seen the movie American History X, Scott? Yes, sure have. Okay, the and neo, the I, Nazi, the neo Nazis, very yeah, very very moving movie. Yes, yeah, you're right with uh, Ed, Ed, Edward. Oh, I can't think of his name. I, Edward I, I saw, I saw Edward Norton in the movie. There you go. So, um, one of the scenes kind of just shows like he's you know still a teenager and his young brother and the sister are there and the mom. 
and the dad just kind of randomly starts saying things that I, at first they're like, okay, I mean, oh, that's kind of weird, dad. Oh, it was like something about how the teacher wanted them to read a book and it was a, an African-American author. And then the dad just kind of came out of there like, oh, no, I can't believe they have you reading this crap and they're trying to push an agenda. I think something along those lines. And I, I think the kind of the point was, this is not someone who would actively call his father a racist. But that's because when you're at a dinner table and you're a white family, there's no referee, right? Like, exactly. you don't right. right. no right. want to say, ah, super insensitive. Right. And so looking back, when you say my parents weren't racist, I'm not at all trying to accuse your parents of being racist. Sure. But were there situations ever where looking back, you're like, ah, oh, yeah, that might have been insensitive. Ah, oh, okay, maybe, you know, like, were you picking up on things that you didn't realize you were picking up on? Well, from your family, and, and, you know. Of course, be honest with you. They, I, I can't. I can't say there wasn't. I mean, I don't recall right. it. And then there possibly was, and and hey, there probably was. I just I can't recall it. But you know, there, at the same time, it, actually, with my dad, it was a little bit of the opposite. Uh, my dad worked for a company in the area, and mm -hmm. th this company employed uh, you know a, a huge a huge African-American, uh, you know, uh, people, you know, that worked for them and, you know, commu uh, the community. And my dad, my dad was real close to them. And I remember, you know, it was, it was slack that my dad took for being real close to them and things like that. And I think I may have rebelled against my dad in a certain extent because I was listening to these other wackos. Mm -hmm. You know, does that make sense? No, of course. I mean, I, I, cause I, if, when we talk about the fact that you weren't necessarily happy at home and you're going to have reasons to rebel against your parents in general as a teenager, but sometimes some parents give us more reasons to rebel and it makes absolute sense to just be like, Oh, is this something that would make you unhappy? Yeah, I could do that. I don't even care if it makes sense. I remember once I told my dad I was going to go to a Greek Orthodox church just to spite him because I'd be like, exactly. well, I'm still going to right. church, right. but I know it's not the church you want me to go to, you know, and, and so, you know, we come up with weird reasons how to get back at our parents, of course. I, I, I completely understand that. And I think that, you know, of course, was was part of it, of course, with him. I, you know, I did do a lot of things to try to get back at him. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. I, and I, I said, actually, I quote, he quoted me in the documentary I did with David da Darrell Davis. You know, some of the things that I saw when I was a kid, I mean, growing up from before I was in elementary school and, and before I was in kindergarten and then up through those years and stuff, I'll be honest, some of the things that I saw would instill PTSD in a fighting soldier. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. I'll, I'll be the first to admit, yeah, I've had to have some therapy over it because it was it was it was detrimental. And, you know, all these things combined. I mean, it, it was really sad. And all these things combined I mean, it destroyed my family. I can understand that. Yeah. No, I, I, and that's kind of, I think, what would make the difference. The, the people who are lucky enough, because, well, one, to clarify, I don't believe PTSD is just for people on a, you know, a battlefield. There's plenty of people walking around with the exact same symptoms. Sure. And I hope they recognize it and get the treatment accordingly. But um, and, <laughs> um, these sort of things, and I've been fortunate like, I will tell people, I'm like, I suffer from PTSD. So there are certain things that will set me off, and it will not be a healthy way of thinking. If somebody starts yelling at me, hands down, I'm plotting your murder. <laughs> I am being oh, quiet and, because I'm plotting your murder. And I understand. I, and I totally understand where you're coming from, yes. But I was, well, one, fortunate enough, I'm, I, you know, I'm raised in Los Angeles. I'm raised in Los Angeles in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So, you know, there weren't really any... I don't even know what group I could have joined. Um, you know, I'm raised in 
middle class, upper middle class neighborhoods. So things like the Klan aren't really an issue. But a big difference as well is that I have a tight family unit. Right. We, we joke. My siblings and I, we joke, we say, oh, we, we suffer from Stockholm Syndrome. So we don't even know if we're close. We're just, we knew we needed each other to, to survive. So sure. now we're like, you know, codependent. Right. Um, whereas when you don't have that backup, to have the exact same experience, but to not have that family or just any support, you know, you're going to go look for it. Because it really, truly is almost impossible to deal with it as an individual alone and exactly right and that's one of the three that's one of i mean when people ask me scott okay why did you get involved with the white supremacist movement or what what drove you in that direction you know i can go into the, all the other things that i've talked to you all about today but the main thing is really it there was something missing within myself there was a void within myself i was looking for a place to a place of belonging. I was looking for a family. I didn't like myself. I didn't like anybody. I didn't like, you know, I didn't like anyone. And I was looking for a place to fit in and, and something that, that that made me feel good. And I found it with these hate groups. Well, of course, because you have this group saying, here, all you have to do is show up and already we're going to tell you that you're better than all of these people. Just based on the color of your skin. Hi, look look who you're better than. You can walk down the street and there you go. You're good right. enough because you're not that guy. And they're and, your family. You know, they're your family. That's what they tell you. They're, we are your family. We'll we'll help you. We'll get you, you know, help you get through life and, and guide you. And yeah, they did. They 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 did guide me, all right. They guide me down the wrong road. One of the main questions I would have now having, you know, and, and luckily you found a way out, but I, you know, okay, as a, as a female of color, but having been raised around a lot of white people, <laughs> I have had to, over the years, kind of, I, I still don't know if I know how to do it, but... I, I'm I'm always curious how to call someone out on their racially insensitive things because I don't think it is very uh, well. I can't think of the word right now. Sorry, after work brain. But I don't think it's going <laughs> to accomplish much if I just call someone out and be like, "That's racist," and then just yell at them. Like, there's been examples of you know somebody, some woman uh, lost her shit. Pardon my French. At a guy, be, uh, as a white, at a white male who had dreads, and um, you know she was just screaming at him, cultural appropriation, and I think she, I think it turned physical. And I was like, all you've done is made this man mad at you, and now open the door for him to be mad at any person of color who now who has an issue with something he says. Like he's right. not going to be approachable. Um, so. You know, like, just trying to find that balance. But if I'm – I may not be able to get through to someone as extreme as, yeah, I'm in the Klan. But I do hear – and i got to say, especially white males, the, the bigger problem being white males, um, the males, should I say. But how do – having been there, having been in the extreme, what would you tell someone who is trying to just say, like, hey – have you ever considered what you're saying is not okay? You know, like, how should we be approaching people if we do encounter them? Sure. To and, be part and, of the reform. Right. Uh, and, of course, and I, I've been around people, and, of course, you know, and, of course, not with my immediate family. Uh, you know, most of my immediate family's passed on, right. and, and they move in different, they live in different areas. But there have been members of my family, extended family, and, of course, friends and things like that. They do harbor these, you know, hardcore, still harbor the hardcore racist uh, attitude. And do, do I approach them when they, when, they, when they sound off about it in front of me and stuff? And, of course, a lot of them know where I stand today. When they sound off in front of me, do I, I engage myself with them in a hostile or, or with an angry tone? No, I never go that direction because, you know, I figure, you know, it's just going to cause more, 
more conflict, more anger, and we're going to end up into a fight and things like that. I'll try to engage him into an from in uh, to a conversation and ask him, you know, why? Why do you feel this way? And why? I mean, why? And I th and I think that's really one of the biggest issues that we have in this country. And of course, you're and and again, I, I don't mean to refer back to Daryl Davis so much, but he, his mm -hmm. main question was, how can you hate me if you never met me or if you don't know me? And and that's right. that's the most important question, you know. Why are you saying these things about people you don't even know? You know, sit. You know, sit. And the best way to know, the best way to find out, know someone is to get up and walk across the room, sit down with them, talk to them, and and ask. You know, on a friendly basis. And and, and not my quote, Daryl Davis's quote again. You know, you're not fighting if you're talking. And and it's the, and it's the truth. And find out exactly what what it is that you know makes them feel that way, and just try and do, discuss it in a calm, you know, friendly manner. And hopefully, hopefully they'll listen to you. And that's basically what the point is. You know, you listen to them, and they listen to you, and we can you know make progress and move forward and and try to get away from this you know awful illness and disease of racism. Do you find though that that works when you approach people and oh and try yeah, to I have, I, sure and, and, and I hate to inter I'm sorry I didn't no, mean to no. interrupt you. Go ahead. Yes, and like I said with Daryl Davis with and his success, you know he uh, one of the most uh, I guess stands out when the gentleman that he talked to and became friends with was a uh, Klansman, high-ranking Klansman. And he wore the robe and hood, but his day job was a police officer. Oh, and, that's scary. Uh, yes, it is. And, and, and it's not uncommon. But he became friends with this gentleman. And then, of course, Daryl ended up owning his robe and hood because he talked to the gentleman. They became friends and he's able to give, you know, have a change of heart and became good friends with Daryl. And, and Daryl and Darryl is planning on taking some of these items, robes and flags and things like that. And putting them in, in kind of like a, a museum, a, a educational museum, so that, you know, so that, we, you know, hopefully we can learn from, you know, the mistakes by others. But that's one gentleman that, you know, really stands out. You know, it's it's always surprising me because I do agree completely with you that it's it's just it's sometimes it's the simple thing of just sitting down and having conversation, but it also shocks me when people actually could be so hateful or so extreme, and yet once you sit down and talk to them, you know they are willing to open up, they are willing to listen. I mean, it, we went back twenty five years. Yes, Shireen and I would probably be too young to really be having an adult conversation, but I doubt the three of us would be able to talk to each other twenty five years ago. Well, that's true, and, and of course. Daryl, and this our movie made it to Texas to the uh, SX Film Fest, and of course won an award there. And we went there for the you know world premiere of it. And we were there, and uh, we were talking, and, and it's true, you know. Of course, you go into any cafeteria or or business or office building that has a cafeteria that has you know multiracial people in it you will i mean not that not that there's anything bad about it not that they're trying to make anything bad about it you'll see you know uh african americans sitting to their self or with each other you'll see whites other races and things like that it's and it's kind of like a a common thing that you you know you just feel comfortable with the people like yourself that you understand and know that's why I said get up and walk across the room and sit down with these people and get to know them. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully, and sooner or later, you know, the, these uh, segregated groups of people are not going to be separate anymore. You know, you're going to be sitting together. And, that, and that's one of the things that really helped me in this alcohol drug treatment center that I went to when I got in trouble. Hey, when I went in, the, the director of the place told me, said, well, you know, we've got cabins here. And we've got people of color, we've got uh, people of different religions, people of different sexual preferences and things like that. Is this going to be a problem? I said, no, I just want to get in, get my paperwork and get out. But I got in and I sat down with 
all of the this diff, all these different people, and we had intimate conversations with each other about our lives, our experiences, and things like that, and got to know them. And you know, I found out you know these people aren't any different than I am. We got problems, mm-hmm. and that's like I said. That's when I went in one person and came out another, and that was the you know that was the most important component was sat down with them, talked with them, and got to know them. I saw on your website that just a couple years back you had made, I believe, your first trip to the Civil Rights Museum. Mm, I'm thinking it was a little more than a couple of years ago, but you're, but you're, you're, you're correct, yes. What now, was actually, that first I, experience like for you to go into that well, museum? I, right. I went to, of course, went to the uh, Civil Rights Museum here in Memphis. Of course, been around Memphis all my life. Never had any interest in going. I went in there and I learned so much, and I was overwhelmed actually with emotions, and and went in, and I I really didn't want to leave because there was so much to see, and I was just really overwhelmed with emotions and and wanting to find out more, and so actually I think it was like a week later I went back, and went back and went through it, and then of course I try to go back because every time you go in the place you learn something, at least I do. And of course, I went in, and it was really. I saw I saw displays. There's a, there's a, there was a display of a Klan robe and hood in a glass encased uh, compartment, you know, for you know for display in the museum. And I really felt nauseated and sick to my stomach because I knew I had been part of that. And it was a you know really a learning experience that you know you you, you can't. You can't pay enough money to get, you know, you just walk in. And again, I was able to take a cold, hard look at myself and realize, you know, what I had done and, and learn from it. You know, most people can't look in the mirror like that at themselves. Do you str- find yourself struggling or did you struggle with forgiving yourself? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, I'll be honest with you, it like to destroyed me. Uh, uh, I almost died. Uh, it. I ended up, I tell you, I ended up sick in around 2008, 2007, 2008, ended up in the hospital. And, of course, I went to the hospital, and they ran a scope down my throat and all that, and they said, your stomach's just loaded with stomach ulcers. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. I have no doubt what caused those stomach ulcers. And it was the the secrets that I held within myself. It was the guilt. And probably the years of anger and things like that that I had, you know, had, that I had within myself. Well, I ended up having to have, you know, like three fourths of my stomach removed. Wow. And then that, of course, that was 2008. They had to do another surgery like six months later. 2010, I ended up again in the hospital. And that's when I almost died. And I, you know, I mean, my, my four or five day hospital stay turned into about eight weeks and I, I left that hospital and I was, you know, I had a lot of time to think and I said, you know, I don't want to leave this world and people li- look at me or think of me and think I'm the same person that I was years and years ago. I, and my, my sister, who had passed away with cancer in 2005, we had discussed this also. She said, you know, Scott, you know, do you regret what you've done? Yes, very much so. Well, you can take that and and help people. And she was correct, you know, right. But I ignored it until 2010, and I had a lot of time to think, and I thought about what the, you know, the, probably one of the most final conversations I had with my sister before she passed away and uh, and it's emotional. It's emotional, but you know, I didn't want to leave this world like that. So I made the decision. I'm going to open up. Everybody knows about my past anyway, but I'm going to hopefully try to change and and make a make a difference in this world. And I well, probably the blog that I kind of use as a website that I, I use is what I did. And I hit the submit button to publish it. And once you do that, it's out there. Mm-hmm. But and I was scared to death. I was scared to death. But 
I was really surprised at the people that opened their arms up to me, and I've just been really grateful. I've been really grateful. How did the how did your former friends in the KKK react to your change of heart? Well, actually, when I left, I turned. I, I did exactly what I said. I left. I, I don't communicate with them, and never. You know, I didn't communicate with them anymore. There are some that, and of course, Daryl Davis has met a couple of them that they talked about, and they think they think Scott's mentally ill because because he has come to the realization that what he's doing today and what he did yesterday and years ago or so was wrong. I no longer think like those people. I no longer do those things. I, you know, I'm considered a race traitor and mentally unstable because of what I'm doing today, but that's okay. I mean, I know they thought you were a traitor, but was there any retaliation? Did they physically act out against you? You know, I, they, of course, I had a lot had a lot of death threats. Uh, and of course, of course, what I just described, you know, how they feel about me now as a race traitor or whatsoever, you know, or, or any other thing. But actually, an actual attempt or an attack on on myself uh no they haven't but there has been an attempt to persuade me to change to shut me up by attacking probably one of the, one of the oldest friends that i've that i've you know that i've got that i've had in my life and uh they showed up at his house and beat and beat him you know severely oh no they had made it, uh, had come by his house on, on one or two other occasions and told him that he needed to talk to me. There was really no one that would, I would listen to but him. And, of course, as hard-headed as I am, you know, this friend of mine knows, you know, talking to Scott wasn't going to do any good anyway. But, uh, yeah, he took, he took a beating, you know, because of me. But that's, you know, other than the threats and the death threats, that's all that's actually, you know, materialized. So, because one of the things, like, in, in obviously in the recent news with, you know, another mass shooting out there, um, you know, and there's lots of things going about. So, when you're talking about tolerance and you want people who hate a certain people for, for no good reason, I mean, you know, what what do you recommend to those of us who want to start the conversation or... You know, what can we do? Just what are, what suggestions do you have to get? Well, I, I, you know, of course, I'll be honest with you. You use the term tolerance. I'll be honest with you. I don't like the word tolerance. We okay. shouldn't have to tolerate yeah. anybody or anybody shouldn't have to tolerate us. Uh, I mean, the word I like and the word I try to use is accept, acceptance. And, yeah. of course, we've yeah. heard so much, so much, you know, that the, about the shooting in Orlando that it could – been a terrorist plot or it could have been a hate crime i mean of course I, i'm not involved with the, with the federal government the politics anything like that if, if the gentleman was involved with uh isis or whatever i don't know but i know what he did i feel was a hate crime i mean and you know against the people of, of that, that uh bar but you know, acceptance right. is the word I like to use, but I mean, I, the, I mean, those people, and, and I say those people because they were in Orlando and I was in Tennessee, the people that were injured and, and, and those that were killed, they're still just like us. I mean, they got a heart, they got families, they, some of them are parents, some of them, I mean, they, they got parents, this... I don't like the term, I don't like to label anybody really gay or or and I and I be honest with you, I was talking and, and I do have I have a lovely lovely friend that I grew up with in in Texas and and we've corresponded about this and we had been talking about this and I told her I don't like the word label because uh, you know labeling someone gay or non-gay we, we all got a heart we bleed red. Right. And, and we love people, and people love us. 
it's it's really a sad situation, you know, when when it comes to that. It is absolutely sad, and it is true. We're all human. All the, and, and, I, and, again, per- and again, and again, and, and again, you, I, I'm saying this today. Have I ever criticized uh, people of different sexual preferences? Yes. Have I ever right. made fun of them? Yes. Have I ever harassed them? Yes. But that, you know, that was another person. Today, I'm, you know, I'm, they're no different than me, and I'm no different than them. You know, they just, you know, they have something going on in their life, and I have something going on mine that, that, you know, is totally different. But so what? We're not. I mean, we're not made to be just alike. And it, it really bothers me, you know, when they when they label them gay and non-gay, and and uh, it, it, it's a bad situation. I mean, it, and I, I'm I'm a, at loss for words because that's a really a a sad situation that's going on in Orlando right now. You know, Scott, I agree with so much of what you just said, and I think a little more what Stream was trying to get at is, you know, you're of a more progressive mind. You, whether it's strength or what it, you know, or God, you were able to change your way of thinking. A lot of people can't, and a lot of us, we want to be able to have talks with people. You know, like I had said earlier, you know, your old self, probably would not have sat down and spoke to myself or Shireen. Well, I, I, well, I probably would have, but I, I, I'd say our conversation would have been more argumentative and, and more of a hostile, you know, tone. And, and we'd been debate, we, it'd, be more, it'd been more of a debate than a discussion and it would, it just wouldn't have worked out. <laughs> but wanting to have hope that, you know, if we could get in a time machine and go back in time and talk to you, knowing what you know now and with your changed perspective, do you have any insight of how we might have been able to talk to the old you or how we could talk to people nowadays that are filled with hate? Well, I do. I mean, of course, looking, looking back, you know, where I came from and the life I lived, you know, I, I think if someone had just looked, you know, grabbed me by the arm, and, and I wasn't a mean person, anything like that. I listened to anyone, but if somebody had just taken me to the side and said, let's sit down and talk, and we sat down and, and talked and, and got into these issues and stuff like that, getting to know me and me getting to know that person and talking about the things that we disagree about. I think I, pro- I think I probably would have started thinking about it a lot earlier in life and, and what was what I was really doing and and what was going on. Because, you know, I, hey, I heard a lot of people just by words and I just and I lost uh, a relationship with my daughter uh, who's 34 years old now as a doctor in Oxford, Mississippi. I lost my relationship with her for so long my and, and my. I was sending my some. I got twin boys, and I was sending one of my twins in a bad direction. He was, you know, wanting to follow and be just like dad. And my change, thank goodness, was was soon enough to catch him at an age where he 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 didn't pick up on that garbage. But I think just basically grabbing someone, sitting them down, and just discussing these things in a in a, in a like Daryl Davis who says, when you're talking, you're not fighting and and just never give up, never give up. And I think that's the root of the whole thing. Talk, you get to know someone, never give up. Was that the basis then of your relationship with, uh, I believe you said the public defender that you'd had that was African American? Well, yes, actually I've had one of one, one that I had in Nashville, but there's also one in Memphis. Let me tell you, I gave him big, more headaches than you could think <laughs> of, because he and like I said, he and he was African American, and I and he knew my background and knew what I was involved with, but he defended me to the core. And like I said, did I learn? No, I got in more trouble than called him, but he was the one I called, and because I, I, you know. I had developed a relationship with him, and I could count on him. And we're still friends, still friends today. And and 
you know, I don't know what I'd done without him. I'd end up in prison or somewhere like that. Did you ever get to ask him, or have you been able to ask him, why he stood by your side? <laughs> I asked him one time, ask him, and of course, he, I, I'll give his first name. He won't mind. His name is Handel. I asked him one time in the elevator. Of course, I said, it's Handel. He said, you're sitting there defending me. And I said, these people think I hate black people. And uh, one question were, well, you know, from him, do you? And I really didn't know how to answer him. And and then he said, oh, don't worry about it. They think I hate white people. And and the thing about it was it, it, it created a attention breaker. And at the time, it was like, uh, you know, humor. And we both started laughing in the elevator. And it broke, you know, broke the tensions that were between us. And we grew and became like brothers. And, well, there again, that was another example of we got to know each other. Wow. And, I, and of course... Okay. He, I'm on Facebook, and his wife's on my Facebook. He's not as a lawyer, you know. I guess he gets mm -hmm. so much, hurt, you know, he's just not on there. But he gets my messages back and forth, you know, and we're, we're still in touch. I mean, a topic like this, I'm sure we could try to talk to you for, you know, 10 million hours. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like our last guest. We were talking about religion, and I was like, I could do this all day! But <laughs> I don't. We, well, you know, we're, we're I, you, I, mean, I know y'all may y'all got time restraint. I know, but I mean, it, it's like this, you know, the, the issue of race and racial problems in this country has become a taboo, a taboo subject. Nobody wants mm -hmm. to talk about it. They want to ignore it and act like you know, act like it's not a problem. Well, I'm sorry, folks, but there is a problem because Scott Shepard was part of the problem. It's mm -hmm. out there, and it's not going to go away until we all make an effort to sit down and talk and try to come to a conclusion where we all can live in this world, this country, and this world happy and, and as brother and sister. But I'm sorry, folks. Don't ignore it because it's there. we got to you find know. a way. And, and it's funny how you say that. Sorry to cut you up, but it's, you know, especially now in 2016, you can't ignore it. Everybody has a cell phone. There's video cameras everywhere. So we're capturing all the acts of racism, yet we are so blatantly still ignoring it. Oh, exactly. ignoring it. No, people are flat out denying it, though. Well, That's the you problem. Know, you, like, exactly. She, she, she took the words right out of my mouth. I was fixing to say, and at first, yes, I agreed. Yes, ignored it. And then I was fixing to say, actually, they're just turning the head away from it. You know, and not facing it and denying that, well, like she she said, deny, I was going to say, just, you know, turn their back on it. Didn't want to, you know, just didn't want to face that there was a real problem. And that's exactly what, the, you know, that is part of the problem itself, denial. <laughs> I, met a, I met this guy, and uh, he's from Georgia, but we were uh, trying to weed this uh, area. And he's like, oh, man, maybe I should wear some gloves. My hands are going to start looking like slave hands. Oh, hey. And I went, I go, you can't say things like that. He's like, what do you mean? Sure I can't. I went, no, you're not in Georgia anymore. You're in California. And now that I'm no longer in Georgia, I'm going to call everybody out. You do not get to say things like that. Right. He's like, what's wrong with that? And I was like, what's wrong is that you don't know there's something wrong with saying that. Well, you know, and it's exactly, and it's true. And, and again, well, of course, growing up in in the state of Mississippi, mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, let me say Mississippi. I'm sorry with my accent. We have a tendency to say Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> it, let me say, it's Mississippi. Okay, I grew up, and it was, it, you know, there hardly was a, a day that went by that I didn't hear the N word. I used it myself and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I'd be honest with you, as, as kids and stuff, we really, at the time, didn't know that we were saying anything wrong. Right. It, it, it was that we were accustomed to hearing it, and we thought it was just something normal. You know, of course, as we got older and stuff like that, we, you know, we come to realize, you know, you, that was wrong. But I can understand, of course, the guy from Georgia, I mean, maybe, maybe he hadn't been in California long enough. You know, to get some of the Georgia out of him, but no, he sure had it. 
It was only two weeks, but that was the whole point. I told him because later on he's like, it hurts my feelings that you think I'm a racist. And I was like, oh, sweetheart, I don't think that you're racist. Like, I don't think you actually look at black people and think you don't like them. I think that you're racially insensitive. And that's right. the problem. Right, right. Because I, I don't think you are discriminating against people based on their race. I just think you're saying shit that's going to piss us off. <laughs> right. <laughs> huge difference. Huge yeah. difference. <laughs> <laughs> and, he may, and, it, uh, and he may not even realize it, but that's exactly what he was doing. Exactly. And that's one of the things that I try to do when I when I discuss racism and I'm trying to discuss, you know, opening the conversation up. It's like, first of all, let's not come at people. Like, when I call someone a racist, it's usually a joke. You know, like, I remember once I was in New York visiting my friend and I just kept saying, like, that's racist. And then finally she was like, no, it's not. I was like, I know. I'll just see what I can get away with. But... <laughs> <laughs> she, um, but I will, I will say something. I want to clarify the the difference between racism and racial insensitivity. And yes, people of color absolutely have the right to be upset with certain things being said because it wasn't that long ago. With that being said, usually accompanied us not getting a an apartment or us not getting a job or someone trying to physically assault us. So. Yeah, we're still going to be a little sensitive because our parents actually today. lived through that still going, still going on today. Yes, yeah. and, yeah, and that's true, too. And, oh, yeah, Lord. Oh, that reminded me. Oh, okay. Because I was, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was in Carson City, Nevada, and going to the movies, just trying to have a good time at the movies in the Capitol. And <laughs> this man in front of us, it was funny, actually, we saw him walking up into the theater and we were like I, I made some joke like oh there's somebody's boyfriend and my roommate was like you mean the white supremacist there and we were just like ah maybe and then sure enough he was wearing a t-shirt that said comp as in mine comp customs right, right with the ss eagle and as that i was just like oh wow 2016 okay keep it classy nevada but, <laughs> you know, that one is actually less surprising. But when I actually went to go have a conversation with someone else about it, they came, they had the nerve to come at me like, well, you're making assumptions. How do you know that's what they're trying to do? And I was like, the burden of the burden is not on me to figure out if he means something else. You put a, you put an SS Eagle and comp in some shit and put it on a T-shirt. You get to assume that other people are making assumptions about your brand. And the assumption is definitely going to be Nazi related. Like, well, exactly right. <laughs> but that's what offended me. That that lack of compassion to people of color that says, well, why are you assuming? Because I'm allowed to. Because when I don't assume, it could be dangerous. So these are the sort of things. Yeah, no, nope, see, we're going to get into another two hours. I can't. Now I got worked up. Well, you know, I mean, it's, 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 I tell you, I'll be honest with you, it's like this, of course, this is 20, 2016. You know, I've been through hell in, in a handbasket and, and with all this and, and, and done so much, you know, bad things. And, and thank goodness, I'm and I'm still, hey, I'm learning today. I mean, I don't know it all. I'm learning today. And yes, even today in 2016, Racism and these things are, are, are not things that you can just forget. You know, you have to really work on. You're taught it, and you, I mean, you just don't forget it. You have to unteach yourself. And there, I mean, every day, I make it a point to check myself to make sure before I speak that I don't say something that's going to be insensitive to somebody because I know where I was came from and know where I was programmed and all that. And right. I don't want I don't want to go in that direction and. And do that, and it's and another example is my grandfather and grandmother were in the uh, movie theater business, and in Mississippi, the African Americans had to go upstairs in a balcony. The whites were downstairs in the lower level. They had to, the the man, uh, African American had to go out the side door, stand outside to get their popcorn and uh, Coca Colas and things like that. That's that's the way it was in the South, and I went up to Daryl Davis, and of course I don't go to the movie that much now because when I was a kid I got to go for free, and I don't like paying to go now, so <laughs> mm -hmm. I just I just don't go. But 
Daryl Davis played a, uh, a a show in an old theater in Bethesda, Maryland. I think it was. Yeah, yeah Bethesda. And I walked in there, and it's made out, the, the, the venue is made out of an old movie theater. And I walked in and looked around. I said, boy, this is nice. I like this. And I was just looking around. I was looking up where the cameras was, and I was looking up in there. And David, Daryl asked me, said, what are you looking for? I told him, I was looking looking for the balcony. That didn't happen in Bethesda, Maryland. Oh, wow. It happened in the South, though. I mean, you know, the, the whites and blacks were separated and weren't allowed to sit together to watch a, you know, watch a movie or or stand out of the rain or out of the cold to get your popcorn and Coke. You know, it was just totally separate. You know, just separated. And it wasn't like that in Bethesda. And it was still... Even though it was 2016, this was just this past Christmas, it was still a shock to me. I mean, I learned something, you know. There it is again. There's something else that I got to check myself because, you know, I'm still trying to unlearn that garbage. Mm -hmm. And I'll be the first to admit, and if I, if I say something out of, out of line, I jump right on it and make sure, you know, my, I'll be apologizing the rest of my life, but that's okay. I know where I'm at today. I know who I am. I know what I'm doing. I know I'm doing the right thing. I know what I did was wrong. And mm -hmm. I'm not going back. There's no way I'm going back to that crap. Well, thank goodness. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> we'll take one less. We'll take one less. Right. And I'm saying, I'm, and I'm, and of course, I'm, I'm being totally honest. I don't want to go there. I'm happy with who I am today and what I'm doing. And, and I, I find it, you know, I find it hard to believe that I, you know, drifted in that direction from my background being raised by Rebecca, uh, Rebecca and was, you know, grew up with her kids and grandkids. And but I sure went down that path and I'm glad I found my way back. We are, too. And we're so glad that you were willing to open up and share your story with us. It seems like you share your story a lot, though. Does it ever get tiring to have to talk about this? Well, not really, because, you know, if I, I tell you, if I if if what I have to say will help one person, one person, it's been worth it from all the things that I've done. And I've had people come to me and say, look, you need to write a book and all that. And you know, I've thought about it and, I, you know, and, and someday I might, but it no, I never get tired of it because, you know, it's where I'm at today. And I've got a, I've got a, a positive mission today. And my positive mission is to make up for what I did in the past and try to prevent some other young kid or an adult, for that matter, from going down the same path that I did from listening to that garbage and, and, and not being able to be happy with themselves, uh, you know, and like I said, I was lucky. I was I was forced in a situation. I had to take a cold, hard look in a mirror of it myself, and I found out who the problem or where the problem was, and it was Scott Shepard. That's the problem. That's what I had to had to get you know get in line, and I'm still working on it. I'm gonna get there someday. <laughs> I agree. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you. It's been a I pleasure. appreciate you. I appreciate y'all giving me the chance to talk. And like I said, I'm not going to say anything else no more. I've talked too much. <laughs> <laughs>